Welcome to the Lexington Public Library's Tales from the Kentucky Room podcast, where we discuss everything Lexington and Fayette County history. I'm Miriam, and in each episode of this podcast, we will feature a guest that will share a piece of local history. So thank you for tuning in and enjoy. In recent years, there has been a renewed interest in the career and music of composer Julia Amanda Perry. An African-American composer, Perry was born in Lexington in 1924. She studied and worked in the major musical centers in the United States and Europe. She also studied with leading composers and won numerous awards and composed music in a diverse array of compositional styles and genres, including 13 symphonies and three operas. Today, we will be discussing her connections to Lexington, Kentucky, as well as her career in music with our own resident musician, David Bryant, who's also the assistant manager of Central Library. Hi, David. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast again. Hi, Miriam. So, as usual, when I start the podcast, I'd like to start at the very beginning. So, tell us a little bit about Julia Perry's family and her early life um, here in Lexington. Okay, sure. Julia was born on March 25th. 1924 in Lexington, Kentucky. She was one of five daughters born to Dr. Abraham Perry and America Louise Heath Perry. They lived at 216 Eastern Avenue, just a few blocks from where the Kentucky Association racetrack was located. Like so many family stories in Lexington, Julia Perry's family has a connection to horses and horse racing. Julia's paternal grandfather, Abraham, was born in Woodford County in 1842. He was an enslaved jockey. After emancipation, he became a thoroughbred trainer and moved to Lexington. And uh, one of the horses he trained, Joe Cotton, won the Kentucky, Tennessee, and Coney Island Derbies. He opened a successful training stable, uh, which undoubtedly opened up financial opportunities for the family. Just a little more information about their life in Lexington. Following emancipation, many blacks moved to Lexington, where property owners with large acreage subdivided land to sell to African Americans in neighborhoods. Um, some of these neighborhoods were Guntown, Goodlow Town, and Kincaid Town. Julia's grandmother, Clara, bought two lots in 1880 in Guntown and built a house that remained in the family until 1934. And the house still stands on Eastern Avenue. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Yeah, it's still there. Yeah. Yeah. And we have done other podcasts about the the African-American enclaves and the towns there. So how did she become, like, familiar with music? Was her family musical? They were involved in horse racing, as you said. But how did she become influenced by music? Yeah, well, music and education were surely an important part of the Perry family life. Her father was a physician and amateur pianist. And her mother was a school teacher who placed great value on education. Her older sister also studied piano, and they studied violin later. Her older sister, America Lois Perry, was a pianist who studied at the Cleveland Institute of Music. She was a highly accomplished musician. Unfortunately, she tragically died young at the age of 20 um, from injuries related to a train crash on a return trip. From previous conversations I've had with you, Mm -hmm. the family didn't stick around Lexington for various reasons. Yeah, the family moved to Akron when Julie was 10. Not a lot is known about why the family moved. We don't know specific reasons, but in general, it's thought there may have been more opportunities for blacks in northern Ohio as opposed to Kentucky. In Akron, Julia studied music in the Akron schools, and I did find an article from the Akron Beacon Journal that illustrates that she did receive some support from the community. The Akron Beacon Journal article from 1952 discusses the the success that she had in Europe after she had left America. Um, And there was a benefit concert held at the Central High School to support her studies with the well-known Italian composer Luigi Dalla Piccola. So here's the article. Julia Perry, acclaimed for music in Europe, Sunday, July 6th, 1952. A former Akron girl, Julia Perry, is well along in her career in music, both as a singer and composer. Miss Perry received part of her education as a recipient of the Knight Memorial Education Fund. The fund was established in 1940 by John S. Knight, president and editor of the Beacon Journal and publisher of Knight Newspapers Incorporated. In memory of his late father, C.L. Knight, publisher of the Beacon Journal from 1907 to 1933. 
Daughter of Dr. and Mrs. A. Perry, Julia has had two compositions published and others are in the process of publication by Carl Fisher and Born Brothers of New York. I'm sure they wanted to brag on th- yes. their local that's, celebrity. That's what it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure she, and she had accomplished quite a, a bit, you know, to be able to go to Europe. and Yeah, so after. As, as an African-American woman. And so mm-hmm. that's that's a big accomplishment. Yeah. So after her time in Akron, then she she attended Akron University for a while. Mm -hmm. Then she studied at Westminster Choir College, earning a bachelor's in 1947 and a master's degree in 1948. Then she completed additional conducting studies at Juilliard School in New York City Mm -hmm. and voice at the Curtis Institute in Philadelphia. Very prestigious schools Mm -hmm. (laughs) that she studied at. And then, notably, she went on to study composition with Luigi Dalla Piccola and Nadia Boulanger, who, for people who aren't really aware of music, uh, Boulanger taught many of the great composers of the 20th century, like Aaron Copland and Elliot Carter. Wow. Names yeah. that... David, you're... you're- a background is in music. You play an instrument, of course, and I want to know a little bit about your background and how you became enamored with Julia Perry. Okay. Before I became a librarian <laughs> in my other life, I'm I'm a musician. I'm a bassoonist, and I studied bassoon in college before I went to library school. Um, I have performed some with orchestras. I, I regularly play principal bassoon in the Huntington Symphony Orchestra in West Virginia, but I've also done quite a bit of freelance playing. I've performed with Louisville Orchestra and the Lexington Philharmonic, among other groups yeah. as well. And David, for our listeners, he does um, a few of our musical type programming. He invites guests here, and we've had the the privilege of listening to a lot of musicians here at Central, and, and it's really nice to to have you and use your connections to have some really neat programming. Yeah, and I think I got interested in the Julia Perry topic because I think a lot of people don't really know yeah. her story. <laughs> and I mean, this is um, she's definitely the lesser one of the lesser known. I guess you can say celebrities coming out of Kentucky, mm-hmm. um, and that's what we try to highlight on the podcast yeah. lately. So. And she was highly successful in in Europe. I mean, I think a lot of, there were a number of African Americans mm-hmm. who went to Europe to yeah. find success as musicians mm-hmm. and performers. But I think you also can't take out of the equation that she was a woman <laughs> as yeah. well. Yeah. And classical music was it was very much a man's profession for many years. I mean, it, her accomplishments are even more impressive when you consider that in American orchestras and, you know, really in Europe as well, women didn't start getting positions Mm -hmm. till the 60s, 70s, but actually really commonly 80s and later. (laughs) So it's it's pretty impressive, the the accomplishments that she achieved. So for the interest of our listeners, we can play a few examples of her music. So introduce us to the pieces that we're going to be listening to. Okay, great. I thought it'd be interesting to listen to a few examples of her music. And we're going to listen to three of her most widely known and performed pieces today. Mm -hmm. The first one is the Stabat Mater. This was kind of her first big hit, as we'll say it. I mean, this is kind of what put her on the map as a composer. It's for soprano and string orchestra. It's composed in 1951. It's based on a, I believe it's a 13th century Christian hymn that portrays Mary witnessing the crucifixion of Jesus.
you know, it, like I said, it was it did launch her career. It was performed in Germany, Austria, and the United States, and it's still probably the most performed of her works. Yeah, today. I mean, if you do a search on Julia Perry, that's probably what you're first going to find is is that piece. What about this next piece? Okay, the next piece is called Short Piece for Orchestra. And it's interesting. It's, it's a pretty striking contrast to the piece before. The Sabat Mater has a more romantic style, and the style of this music, it's more angular and brash. And this piece was performed by the New York Philharmonic in the 1960s. And then the last piece that I thought would be fun to listen to is called Homunculus CF. And oh, this, that's fun to say. Yes, exactly. Homunculus yeah. CF. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's a fun um, word. <laughs> it's for percussion, harp, piano, and celesta. So what exactly is a celesta, Dan? Well, a celesta is like a type of percussion instrument. It, it's kind of like a piano where the, the hammers strike metal bars for the pitches oh. instead of strings. really is more representative of her more experimental styles and I think it really shows the development of her own unique musical language. Sort of the background on this is really interesting. She composed the piece after she had returned to America and she was living in an apartment above her father's medical practice. And the piece depicts the sounds she heard coming from medical equipment in the office below. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, so I found some words that she, that, you know, her own words about the piece from CD liner notes to describe the piece. She says, Homunculus CF for 10 percussionists was composed in Akron, Ohio during the summer of 1960 in my apartment situated on the top floor of my father's physician and surgeon's office, equipped with all the necessary facilities except a piano. These clinical surroundings evoked memories of the medieval laboratory where Wagner, youthful apprentice to Faust, made a successful alchemy experiment, fashioning and bringing to life a creature he called homunculus. Having selected percussion instruments for my formula, then maneuvering and distilling them by means of the chord of the 15th, this musical test tube baby was brought to life. <laughs> I thought that was really cute. That was. <laughs> What an apt description of this piece, yeah. Yeah. And her music is, it's very academic. Mm -hmm. And I think it's its the kind of music where people would study it. And, you know, you, you may not grasp it the very first time you listen to it. But as you listen, you can really develop the appreciation for the form and the expression. After an extensive musical career, what sort of legacy did she have for other musicians? What did she leave behind? Well, unfortunately, a lot of her music has been lost. After she returned to America... That was actually some of the more productive times of her career. She okay. actually composed a lot of music, but she it was a little more challenging for her to get performances in America. And also, unfortunately, her health took a turn for the worse in the early 1970s, and she suffered a series of strokes that left her paralyzed on her right side and in a wheelchair. And from what I've read, a lot of the music is lost because it wasn't preserved in archives. She was striving to get most of her music published, mm -hmm. but at this, but there wasn't a lot of it wasn't preserved for future generations. So what is left 
um, is not really representative of the many pieces mm -hmm. that that she composed. Um, but of what is left, I think people are really starting to look at it again, and it's getting more performances, like the Lexington Philharmonic is performing music by her. I've also seen where Cincinnati Symphony is, is performing um, some of her music as well. So I think it's, I, I'm really hoping that, that it's, there's sort of a resurgence in interest in yeah, her music. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for, for doing the research and, and letting us into the world of, of Julia Perry and the music of Julia Perry. Thank you so much. I hope people enjoy it. A special thanks to Dr. Yvonne Giles for her research and assistance with information about Julia Perry's family and background. Thanks for listening to Tales from the Kentucky Room, a podcast brought to you by the Central Library's Kentucky Room staff at the Lexington Public Library. If you enjoyed listening, please take a minute to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher. If you have any questions about local history or genealogy research, you can visit us in the Kentucky Room to use our collection and newspaper microfilm, or you can email us at elibrarian at lexpublib.org. That's elibrarian at L-E-X-P-U-B-L-I-B dot org. I'm Miriam, and we'll be back with another trip down Lexington's memory lane.